Each Sunday, we have the opportunity to come to the table as believers in Christ to remember and reflect on the promise of life that God has given to each and every one of us. This is not something to be taken lightly, as our faith in Jesus impacts every aspect of our lives. Jesus says in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. In this verse, we see that Jesus is the source of power and life. As the branches, we are not only dependent on, but also an extension of Jesus. So right here, I have a very simple flashlight, if you can see it here. It turns on, it turns off, I'll try not to blind you, but it works. This is what you can expect of a flashlight. So if I remove the power source, the battery, we can see that it no longer works. I have to take it all the way out in order for that to actually be effective. It no longer works as a flashlight. It takes up the same space as a flashlight. It looks like a flashlight, but it's not going to work as a flashlight. It could work as maybe a toothpick holder, if you fit that in there, but that's not really the design of what it's supposed to do, be. But when you have the battery connected, you truly get the value of a flashlight. Sometimes we can look like followers of Jesus, but we don't have life because we have lost our connection with Jesus. How do we stay connected in the first place? Jesus answers that for us in the verse we just read when he says, remain in me, or to abide in me. The word abide found in the King James Version or the NASB actually carries a greater significance as this comes from the Greek word meaning intensive. In John 15, four and five, Jesus states that for time, and we know that whenever we see something replicated in the Bible, that is very important and it carries a very big significance. You see, Jesus wants to have a relationship with each and every one of us, consisting of a, an intense connection. He has already done the work for us at the cross, and all we need to do is accept him. Please join me in prayer and communion. Heavenly Father, thank you for the sacrifice of Christ Jesus. You love us so much, and you don't want to be apart from you. Forgive us when we fall short, and help us to stay connected to you. Let us open our hearts and fill us with your spirit, so that we can be shining light that points to you. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Today we arrive at the end of the second chapter of the book of Esther. If you are just joining us, we are in the Old Testament book of Esther and we are arriving at the end of the second chapter. At last week we saw this crazy beauty pageant type thing. Um, you could even say it was like an ancient Persian version of The Bachelor, but instead of getting a rose, you get a crown. I mean, it was crazy nuts. And the good thing out of all of that was a Jewish young woman was crowned queen. Anybody know what her name was? Esther. The book's named after her. Esther was crowned as queen. Now we saw last week also that Esther was orphaned. She was raised by her cousin Mordecai. He adopted her. He raised her. And during this process, there was a year-long beauty treatment before she was chosen as queen. And in this year process, Scripture reveals Mordecai would go and he would walk outside and check on her and make sure she was okay. I mean, he had a father's heart for her. But also she had a heart for him in that she was obedient to his instructions, his counsel. And we're going to see that as we continue to go through. In other words, they had a great relationship it was a great relationship, one in which God was going to do great things. But we find at the end of chapter 2 that Esther is queen and Mordecai now 
gets a place of honor that he is a palace official. Specifically, he was a guard at a gate, king's gate. Let's go ahead and we're going to see, I'd like to put a picture up of what ancient Persia looked like. And you see kind of in the middle, it says the king's gate. Now on the other side is, is the square of the city, the city square where all the people gathered. And there was a bridge and there was a moat that went to the king's gate. So you wanted someone that you trusted to be able to guard that gate because that was the common people's access to the palace. And this is where we find Mordecai. And what's amazing about this is that that actual city gate was discovered in archaeological expeditions in 1970. I mean, that's pretty cool, right? This isn't just stuff that's made up. This is historical events that science and archaeology prove to be true. You know, we live in a society where people are trying to change the history books, but I'm telling you, history can't be changed because it happened and the Bible is true historical events. And we see that that actual gate where Mordecai served was found by archaeologists. Pretty cool stuff. Well, the king's gate was located on the east side of the palace, guarded the main entrance again there was a bridge and a moat going to that gate and it was an important place of protection. Important place of protection. Now, it does not reveal in scripture how he got this position. Was it because he's related to Esther and she's now queen? I don't know. We don't know the answer to that. What we do know, it was God's providential hand. God was working because we see why in Verses 19 through 23 of Esther chapter 2. Because Mordecai was at the right place at the right time. It wasn't coincidence. It wasn't luck. It was God's providence at work to place Mordecai in a place where he would hear a plot to assassinate the king. Let's go ahead and look at this. Esther chapter 2 verses 19 through 23. Even after all the young women had been transferred to the second harem and Mordecai had become a palace official, Esther continued to keep her family background and nationality a secret. She was still following Mordecai's directions, just as she did when she lived in his home. One day, as Mordecai was on duty at the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, Big Thana and Teresh, and if anybody's looking for a baby name, I think Big Thana is a good one. Not Thana, Big Thana, okay? Just throwing that out there. And Teresh were guards at the door of the king's private quarters. They became angry at King Xerxes and plotted to assassinate him. But Mordecai heard about the plot and gave the information to Queen Esther. She then told the king about it and gave Mordecai credit for the report. When an investigation was made and Mordecai's story was found to be true, the two men were impaled on a sharpened pole. Wow, they were killed, right? This was all recorded in the book of the history of King Xerxes' reign. Again, we see God's providential hand. Mordecai is in a position where he is in a place of authority. He's protecting the king's gate. But not only that, we see that he is hearing an assassination plot. He is hearing something that God is going to use to really unfold his redemption and salvation. So what we want to see, though, is what can we learn from Esther and Mordecai's behavior? What can we learn from them? If you have your bulletin, this is where we're going to guide through. That from their example, we are reminded that God wants us to do good to all people. God wants us to do good to all people. Now think about it. Mordecai had to have some feelings involved in this situation. I mean, here is his cousin slash daughter that is now queen to a king that is a pagan, 
a king that has a track record of drinking way too much and making horrible decisions, and a king who has a track record of mistreating women and has a harem now of over 400 women. Huh. Wonder what he's thinking. He's probably, I mean, I'm just thinking through this in my mind, thinking, I'm wondering if he's like, what if I just don't say anything? Maybe this king can really just get out of the way and Esther can come back to my house and not be exposed to all this, right? Well, he didn't do that because he did what was right. He did what was good to all people. And you think about Esther. Here she is now queen, now wife, but he still has this harem. She could have easily said, okay, Mordecai, I see what you're saying, but I, I'm not going to share this. Well, also, there was a very strong law that you couldn't go unannounced to the king. I mean, she's at risk, right? Or she could have said, now, his ancestors, how they treated my ancestors, I'm just not going to say, it. but no, feelings aside, Opinions aside, judgments aside, they did what was right. They did what was good for the king, and they shared the plans, and it saved the king's life. My question for you is this. Have you ever struggled being kind? Have you ever struggled doing good to someone that you didn't agree with or who have offended you in one way or another? Did you ever struggle being kind to them when they hurt you or hurt your loved ones? Did you ever struggle doing good to them when they mistreated you? We've all struggled with that. Every single one of us. We're human. We have feelings. We have emotions. You hurt my feelings. All this, right? We struggle with that. But that's where we need to understand that we need to submit our feelings, we need to submit our offenses to God's will and to God's word. God is judge, not us. Vengeance is God's, not ours. And to withhold good from others is disobedience to God and sin. Whoa. Really? Yes. It is sin to withhold good from other people. Let's fast forward to the New Testament. Galatians chapter 6 verse 10, Apostle Paul speaking to the believers in Galatia. And this is what he says, therefore as we have the opportunity, let us do good to only people we like. No. Let us do good to only people who do good to us. No, let us do good to all people, all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Now, first of all, notice that Paul says, as we have the opportunity, opportunity there is the Greek word that means God's appointed time. We don't determine when to do good to other people. God determines it. We seek God. We are faithful to follow God's leading and we do good as he leads no matter who they are, no matter if we like them or they like us, no matter if they do good to us, we do good to all people as God appoints, God's timing, God's direction. So that means we're seeking God constantly. Every time you go out in your busy life, if you're at school, young people, or if you are in the grocery store, you go to the doctor or whatever you do, you are seeking God for opportunities that he leads you to do good to all people. Now, Paul makes it very specific to all people. And that includes people that we don't like, we don't agree with, people have been mean to us, people that have cussed us out, flipped us off, whatever has done to offend you or hurt your feelings. We are to do good to all people. Jesus made it very clear, God's heart on this issue. In Matthew 5, 43 through 47, Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you that you may be sons of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? 
or not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. I don't know if you've noticed what's going on in the world right now. There's a lot of hate. There's a lot of violence. And this is an area the church cannot be silent or absent. The world needs to see the church loving our enemies, praying for those who persecute us. The world needs to see the church being a light in darkness and not us determining if someone deserves it, but God determining by saying all people. The world needs to see that. But back to what Paul said. He said, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Church, this is crucial. The world will know we are followers of Jesus by how we love who? Each other. The world will know that we belong to Jesus by how we love each other. So if the church gets mad and leaves because someone hurt their feelings, are we truly showing the world the power of God to love beyond our opinion or preference? I don't think so. If we are not willing to forgive other Christians, if we are holding grudges or if we're judging, are we showing the world that we belong to Jesus? No. That's why Paul says here, especially do good to those who are brothers and sisters in Christ because the world is watching and they can smell a hypocrite a mile away. And if we go out and take care of widows and orphans and serve at food pantries, but we don't love another Christian, we are a hypocrite, we are a phony, and we are a liar. They will know we are his followers. They will know we belong to him by how we love each other. Then go out and love the world. Then go out and do good to all people. But if you do good to the world, but you treat other Christians like dirt, then we are living a lie. And what we do in the world is empty because we're not faithful to those God has called us first to be faithful to. And it's not easy. People hurt your feelings, right? But we base it upon God's love for us and God's goodness to us. And again, Mordecai and Esther chose to do good to the king beyond their personal feelings. They chose to do good because it was right. And as Paul says, that we are to do good to all people, but especially to those who belong to the family of believers. And here's the other tricky part. And you'll see this in your bulletins. God wants us to do good even if there's no recognition or reward. Now, when my girls were young, and this is for everybody, it's not just my girls. When kids are young, they want to do things for a reward, right? I remember seeing people, they would reward their kids for eating dinner. What? Seriously? No, you eat dinner because you're going to get sick if you don't. We should not be good to people just because we get recognition or reward. We need to be good to people because God has called us to be good and because God is good to us. Mordecai and Esther's life-saving intervention only got a notation in Xerxes Chronicles. There was no parade. There was no party. There was no promotion. Actually, we'll see next week, somebody else got a promotion instead of Mordecai. And what happens, we especially struggle when someone else gets that award or gets that recognition that we deserve. But we need to not be discouraged because the truth is, is our reward should not be one that we pursue from people. It should be for God. It should be for God. We live in a fallen world. There are broken people all around. If we do things only to get a recognition or reward, we're going to constantly be disappointed. There was a period of time a couple years ago, my family can attest to this, that I was raised to always open up the door for someone. So if you, if you are at Walmart, I'm going to race and open up the door for you. That's just how I was raised, okay? But I got into this thing that I was doing it for the wrong reason. 
I would go and open up the door, and if they didn't say thank you, I would say, you're welcome. What a jerk. I mean, seriously, I did. I did. I was like, you're welcome. And they'd look at me like, loser, you know. And my wife, so gently, she waited till later. We get in the vehicle, and she goes, you know, I think when you say you're welcome, it's missing the point, and you're kind of misrepresenting yourself. That, that didn't feel good, but it was true. I had to check my heart. I was doing it only to get a response, only to get a great thank you. You're the kindest person in the world. When we do good, it should not be for other people's reaction or response. We do it for an audience of one. We do it for a reward, not in this earth, because this is a fallen world. The truth is, I don't think they were being rude or mean by not saying thank you. I think they were just probably having a bad day. I think they were struggling, stressed. Maybe a family member had cancer. Maybe they lost their job. And I'm over there like, you're welcome. Audience of one. Why do we do good? Why do we do good to other people? Because God is the one who rewards. Jesus said this in Revelation twenty two twelve. Look, I am coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. We need to trust that the reward God gives is all that matters. Is all that matters. We don't do good for the response of the people. We don't do good for gratitude. We do good for God's glory. Chapter 2 of Esther ends with the punishment by death of the two conspirators against the king. We also see again that Mordecai's deeds were written down, but nothing happened. No recognition. Sometimes we get a delayed reward, or sometimes we get no reward, but we should not do it for the reward or recognition. We do it for God. But we see in the life of Esther and Mordecai, God is going to use this. Back about five years from this point, God is going to have those chronicles read. The king's attention is going to be brought to it, and it is going to be a part of God's unfolding redemption for all his people. God was working in ancient Persia. God was orchestrating. He was in control. But the true question for us, and really the question for Esther and Mordecai, is where was their heart in doing good? And the question for us, where is our heart in doing good? I'd like to close with these questions. Are we allowing God to work in our life by doing good towards others? Are we allowing God to work in our life by doing good to others? good towards others? Or are we with blinders on, so consumed, so obsessed with everything in our life, we don't even see the opportunities to do good to other people? Second question, are we giving God control of our relationships and opportunities to show his love, grace, and kindness to others? And last of all, are we especially being faithful to those who belong to the family of believers? As Jesus said, John 13, 35, love, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. May we be faithful in doing good to show God's love to others, but may we be faithful above all to love, care, and do good towards other believers because the world is watching and they need to see the love of God here first. And then we can show them the love of God personally in their lives.